Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Sorry about the delay. I'm having technical difficulties, as always. Always at the last minute. I'm about ready to take a sledgehammer to my computer. Uh, never fails. Every time I have a broadcast laid out and I have things planned, uh, nothing seems to work properly. And uh, that's what happens when you're operating on old equipment and antiquated equipment and you can't afford to buy anything uh, and replace it. So uh, between that and I having issues with the internet right now. I apologize for the few minutes of dead air, but it is what it is. So I have uh, an entire broadcast planned for you guys tonight. Hopefully uh, it'll go off without a hitch. Uh, I have a few things I wanted to get into. I apologize for, uh, as I said, the delay. I'm just a little bit uh, flustered right now. Like as I said, I'm about ready to tear my computer out of the wall and throw it out of the window next to me uh, and take the night off. I'm, I'm that angry. But uh, anyway, I digress. I want to get into a few things uh, tonight. One of them is this EBT card thing. Another thing is I want to talk about a young lady being punished for doing the right thing. She actually got punished, thrown off. A, she was the captain of the, uh, the volleyball team. Uh, if I remember correctly, you'll hear the audio, but she um, she got removed from being the captain. She got in trouble, uh, and the school was punishing her because she did the horrific crime of showing up to give a drunk friend a ride home. A girl who was at a party, underage drinking, uh, called her friend and said, look, I'm drunk, and I obviously I, I shouldn't have been drinking, but uh, I was, and I'm in a situation where I'm drunk, and if I drive home, I'm going to get in a car accident. Can you come get me? So this young lady did the responsible thing, and she's actually being punished for it. Uh, just I insane. She's, she's literally being punished. Being punished for doing the right thing. I, I don't know how to explain the insanity. Explain that. I mean, people, if you can't see that there's a problem here with this, I mean, do, aren't we supposed to teach our kids to do the right thing? Don't we tell our kids that if your friend is drunk at a party, you should give the kid a ride home rather than let the person drive home drunk and get into an accident and possibly kill themselves and somebody else, maybe a whole family? Busload of nuns or something? I, 
I don't know. I just think it's 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 a little odd that there are people that are okay with this, and there are people that I mean, I get it. I, I know why this world is so backwards and topsy turvy right now. So, sometimes I think half the people that are okay with things are just saying that because they don't really understand the full depth of what's going on. Other people are into it, but some people are just ugh. I mean, the school system. What is wrong with the school system? And I'll tell you what's wrong with it. They have a zero tolerance policy. We have a zero tolerance policy for students drinking. Ah. You have a zero tolerance policy for students drinking and partying, but the kid wasn't partying or drinking, and the police that were on the scene that were called, which is what led to this whole mess, because someone called the cops because they were having this party. The police that were on the scene even said that the young lady wasn't drinking wasn't doing anything wrong, and actually, she was doing the right thing, but nope, 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 school policy says, we have a zero tolerance policy, if we show her leniency, then we have to show others leniency, do you see why zero tolerance policies are stupid, I've talked about this before, it's the same thing we're going after, uh, you know, zero, we have zero tolerance for, for kids that smoke cigarettes on the school grounds, when I was a kid, you, you got caught smoking once in a while. It was like a fact of life. It was something that was going to happen. Um, now, when I well, well, I guess when I was graduating high school, they they started changing it. They started the health department started fining people if you got caught smoking in school, and and now it's you know zero tolerance. You get caught. I mean, they'll they'll call the cops on you for that. You know, get a fine, get thrown out. I'm not saying kids should be smoking, but really, you call the police for every little thing now. It's zero tolerance policy. We have no, we have no tolerance for that type of behavior. Zero, none. That's like our drug policy. Zero tolerance. Oh, that's great. How's that going for us? So stupid. Absolutely retarded. And that's why we have the problems that we have. Because we're not thinking properly. We're not even thinking. I mean, we're running around with our heads up our rear ends. The EBT, uh, the EBT wannabe riots or mini riots, whatever you want to call them. Just wait. And then, oh, I got audio. This uh, it's from World Star Hip Hop. They went down to, uh, in L.A. and they were talking to some of the EBT card users. And you hear these people, man, ain't nobody got any other way to feed their families. Um, newsflash. I'd hate to break the uh, the news to you, but um, maybe you should go and figure it out on your own. It's not the government's job to feed you or feed your families. Well, man, the people are going to turn to crime. Well, you see, that's the problem. You are you think that there's only two solutions. There's only two possible solutions to your your predicament. Either you go rob somebody and hurt somebody to take their stuff, or the government gives you a handout so you don't rob nobody. Um, isn't that kind of like extortion? Isn't that kind of like pretty much saying, if you don't give me money in a handout, I'm going to go riot. I'm going to go cause trouble. We're, no one's thinking. You can see it. I mean, there's so many different examples of like how we're just disconnected. It's unbelievable. We need to wake up. People seriously need to wake up and pay attention as to what's going on. Everybody's freaking out. Whoa, the government shut down. The reason why things are so bad is the Republicans. I keep seeing that. Oh, I keep seeing smart people. Blow the Republicans. It's their fault. Oh, stop watching the news. Think. Use a little bit of critical thinking. Please. Start to look at these different stories and the different things that are presented to you. Uh, just start to pay attention. I mean... How again? Going back to the kid, the the the, the girl that uh, she's from Massachusetts. She's an honor student. How, how do you justify? How do you justify punishing this young lady? She did the right thing. It makes no sense. Now, honestly, it doesn't make any sense that they're punishing her. It absolutely makes zero sense. Well, we have zero tolerance. She was at the party, Popeye. She shouldn't have been there. She was called up. Listen to the story. She was working. You know, I'm just gonna. I, I'm just gonna play the audio because I'm already in a mood. 
and it's gonna it's just gonna rile me up here. Listen to the audio for a second. Of course, I'm gonna interrupt it, but honor student being punished for trying to do the right thing. She offered to drive her friend home from a party where there was underage drinking. Police confirmed she was not, but she's being disciplined by her school. ABC's Lindsay Janis has the story. Police confirmed she wasn't drinking, wasn't doing anything wrong, but she's going to be punished anyway. Because she shouldn't have gone there. She shouldn't have been around the drinking and the partying. So what the message to the children is, is now being set, that if your friend calls you up, regardless of the fact that the school says, oh, you're not supposed to be drinking or near parties, if your friend goes to a party and gets drunk, it's better to let your friend drive home drunk and possibly kill themselves and other people than to do the responsible thing and go pick them up. That's what you're teaching the kids. You're teaching the kids to not get involved, not do the right thing. Good message. Erin Cox is an honor student and a star player on her high school volleyball team with dreams of playing at college. But this morning, she's sitting the bench after she was stripped of her captainship and suspended for five games in the middle of her senior year. And it's all because she says she was doing the right thing, answering a call from a friend who needed a ride home from a party where there was underage drinking. Erin had just finished work earlier this month when she went to pick up that friend. She goes to a party because someone there says, can you, can you come take me home? I want to go home. She gets there, and literally minutes later, the police show up. But Aaron's school in the Boston suburbs has a zero-tolerance policy when it comes to parties where drinking is involved. And they punished her, even though her family lawyer says police confirmed Aaron hadn't been drinking. If a kid asks for help from a friend, you don't want that friend to say, sorry, I can't help you. I might end up in trouble at school. She's very fragile, and I'm worried about her. I'm very worried about her. She didn't do anything wrong. In a statement to ABC News, the family lawyer also said this, quote, by punishing Aaron Cox, the North Andover School District sends a contrary and very dangerous message that young people are better off letting their friends drive drunk. The parents of one of Aaron's teammates agree. They claim that she, ha she was arrested and she was not. And, you know, they made the decision based on nothing coming from Aaron or her family. I would, that's the parents, not the parents of the young lady that got screwed with. That's the parents of the, the uh, another teammate, uh, obviously another young lady that's on her uh, volleyball team at school. This is another set of parents who are obviously, you know, they, they have their eyes open and they can see that this is just completely stupid. This isn't even her kid. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because it's like, it's, it's like a independent third party, if you will. I mean, you even have the police saying that this girl didn't do anything wrong. She gave the kid a, you know, she went there to give the kid, her fellow teammate, student, you know, human being, a ride home. We're teaching our kids, we're teaching the future generations on how not to interact with each other. Like all normal human behavior, we're punishing them for, oh, no, you're not supposed to do that because kids could get hurt because, oh, my God, we're the school and we run things. No, you're the school. Your parents need to tell the high school to screw off. The problem is there's so many parents that will like this type of behavior. There's a lot of parents that will be like, well, you know, I think it's a good thing. I'm sure there's parents that you'll find out there that will say, oh, it's a good thing. These parents need to band together and tell the school district to stick it. Well, we're going to punish her. I mean, absolutely unacceptable. I would, if I were the parents, I, I, I you know, depending on the cost, but I, I would, if it was reasonable enough, I would pursue this in a lawsuit. I mean, if you win, you get them to pay the, the da you make you make the school pay for your your lawyer fees. That's usually what happens when you win a lawsuit. The the loser has to pay the winner's lawyer fees, sometimes, or at least fifty percent of the time. <clears throat> I would sue. I mean, I don't like frivolous lawsuits and all that, but th I mean, this I would I would go after it because I mean, you that that's a permanent mark on her record. Uh, and two or three years from now, if this girl goes to apply for a school and say they say, well, we want your high school records and your transcripts, and they look through it and they say, oh, why were you you were thrown off the uh, as the captain of the of your volleyball team? Why why is that? Uh, I, I see you got in trouble for being at a party where there was a lot of underage drinking going on. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't partake in the drinking. I was just there to drive a friend home. And Right. 
uh, the person who you're sitting with, who is totally disconnected from the area that you that you grew up in, is really going to b- buy that story. So you really think that this little girl is not going to get a fair shake, or is going to get a fair shake if that stays in her record? No, it won't. Unfortunately, they look at things like that, and they will judge her based on that. And the person wasn't there, you know. They're not gonna. The, the person talking to her, asking her about it, is it's gonna be. They're gonna be interviewing her, and maybe they, maybe they'll let it go. But they'll always have that in the back of their mind. When she, and if she, if she was doing something wrong, fine. Then okay, whatever, fine. She had done something wrong. First of all, what is with this punishing kids till the end of their lifetimes for things, mistakes they make when they're fourteen or fifteen years old? They call them mistakes for a reason. I mean, they didn't do that. They're not on purposes. Absolutely ridiculous. People need to, like, pay attention. Hello? We're molding. When you do this stuff with the kids, everybody's, oh, my God, it's to protect the kids. We have to keep them safe. They're our babies. Oh, my God. Guess what What, what happens? Those, those little babies turn into adults who are useless members of a society. They are literally useless useless. They can't do anything without being told what to do by a superior parental type figure, authority type figure. How many people do you know that are completely and utterly useless? This is what we're doing. We're setting up the future generations of this country to literally be dumber and easily uh, controlled by the powers that shouldn't be by these sheep herders. We're literally setting it up for them. And there's people that are crying out for it. Oh my god, the boogeyman is going to come bite me. I need you to save me, please. I love you. I'll kiss your butt, government. Just save me. Do whatever you got to do. I'm afraid of insert fear here. I mean, that's what they do. They get, this country has been reduced to, you know, a bunch of crybabies. They're going to... I want to finish this audio before I get, I, I get onto the EBT thing, because that's where I'm headed with this. But let me finish the audio up. Of the girl, remember, a young lady suspended for doing the right thing and trying to go to a party. After she was working her job, she, went to, she didn't go to the party. She went to the party to pick somebody up. And... You know, she didn't go to the party to party. She went there to pick up a friend who was drunk and called her and said, I need to ride home so I don't get into an accident and kill myself or somebody else. Oh, but hey, look, kids doing the right thing. I mean, okay, they're underage drinking. Kids do that. But at least they're, do- <laughs> they're being responsible. And, but no, they don't get any, any kudos for that. No. I hate to see this hurt her chances of excelling in college. Now, Aaron's mother and her lawyer are working to get the school to reverse its decision. He did what she thought was right. And I'm proud we contacted Aaron's school and its lawyer both declined to comment. Aaron's mother filed a lawsuit against the school on Friday, but a judge ruled the court didn't have jurisdiction. Now she's considering other legal options against the school. Larry, you know what they say, no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. All right, Lindsay, thank you so well, much. I wish the school would have said something. I really want to know. Don't want to hear from the school. Oh, I wish, oh, George Stephanopoulos, I wish, I wish the school would have said something. I would have liked to have heard from them. Really? Really? What, so you could agree with them and try, well, you know, the school did make this opinion about it, and blah, 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 but the school doesn't want to opi- make an opinion on it, because they look like a bunch of D-bags, that's why. I mean, really. Seriously. When I saw this earlier today, I was, I was already in a mood today, I've, you know, today's been one of those days. I mean, look, even I had, you know, little technical gremlins running around right you know, at the beginning of the show, right? So it's just been one of those days where it's one thing after another. And I sat down uh, going over the news and everything and uh, doing a little bit of show prep about three hours ago uh, in between uh, getting dinner prepared and things like that. And I stumbled upon this video, and I saw it. It was the, you know, the, the, the news piece from ABC today. And I saw this, and I was absolutely just... I mean, there are... There are days, like, I don't even think it has anything to do with my mood. It's just there are days that, I, I, you know, I could be in a good mood, bad mood, does not matter, whatever. 
there are certain things you you know I'll be going through my the the my news whatever and usually I'm you know even keel but there are some things that just set me off and this is one of them like it's just hello you're teaching this kid and any future generation because remember her peers are paying attention ladies and gentlemen they all have cell phones and computers now remember when we were kids what we did yeah okay well magnify that a thousand fold because of technology right so these kids these kids all know what's going on they're paying attention what do you think is going to happen hmm let me ask you that what do you think is going to happen in Oh, I don't know, within the next five, ten years to these kids. They are going to have experiences in their lives where they maybe should have done the right thing, right? But because of this experience with the school, now it doesn't matter if they're out of school by this time. People say, well, they could be out of school by that time. It doesn't matter. The programming is there so that the, the child at a young age learns that you must, you know, pretty much acquiesce to this authority figure and you have to go to this authority figure for every little thing under the sun, Right? Well, what do you think you see with the EBT card thing? People flipping out. Oh, my God, the government, they, they're they required to feed me. They're required to take care of me. It's that same training. might be a different way because they're doing it via the food stamp program, but they're doing it to the children as well. They're training them that it's the, 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 the person in that position of authority, and I'm doing air quotes when I say authority, the supposed authority, faux authority, whatever you want to call it, costume, whatever they're wearing, it doesn't matter, um... They're being trained that they're the ones that they have to turn to and that they're the only ones uh, that can solve any problems and that, it, you know, you can be punished for any little thing now. I mean, kids kids are being trained that they, you, literally it's like a prison system school. I mean, they're, they're, they're being trained. Think about this. You, they're being trained to not do the right thing and look out for one another. So now when they're adults, they're going to carry that training. They're going to carry that, not looking out for one another, obedience to authority figure. Why do you think you see these young adults? I've said this a hundred times, and everybody I've ever talked to off air about this, even when you know I, I have a guest on, uh, you know, I usually chat with them for a few minutes after the show is over off air. And uh, if this comes up, it's usually the same thing. I'll say, you, you ever notice how stupid the younger generations are? Like you'll go to and a younger crowd. I'm not picking on you guys. Not all of you, obviously. If you're listening to the radio broadcast or you're 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 trying to reach out for this type of information, well, then you're you're pulling yourself out of that ignorance. We were all in it, but this younger generation is just completely different. I mean, they don't even know how to change a tire. When I was a kid, it was, you know, we had auto shop, we had metal shop, we had wood shop. And I know they changed all that and got rid of all that. Uh, but at least your parents, your father taught you how to change a tire. Um, your uncle taught you how to change a tire. Your brother might have taught you how to change. Somebody taught you how to change a tire. Uh, the, the, the simple things like that, no. Uh, the obedience to authority, they go to Target. You, you go to Target, you go to Walmart. You get a 22, 23-year-old kid, maybe at the most, uh, working the cash register, and something happens. Bloop, bloop, bloop. They're scanning all your stuff. All of a sudden, error. And a lot of times, they'll maybe hit a button, and it goes away because they know that that's the button they hit. But what happens when they hit that button, and it don't go away? Then they'll hit the button four or five times, and then six or seven times, and then they stare at the thing, drooling. I had to buy medical tape one day. Medical tape, as you know, it comes in these those little round containers. They're usually plastic or metal, and they're... They pop out it's like a, a cylinder around the top of the, the tape roll, right? Well, while the guy was handling it, he accidentally popped it out of the cylinder, the, the roll that covers the, the little cylinder that covered the roll. And it took him literally, I, I was going to say something earlier, but I wanted to see how long it would take him. It literally took him about two minutes, and he was just staring at it. I, I swear to God, it was the most awkward few minutes I've ever experienced just standing there because it was like time and froze and this kid had no idea how to just put a roll of tape back into the container he had to literally look at me and I had to explain it to him has anyone else noticed that the internet seems to be acting up lately I'd say the past like Six, eight months, it's been really acting up. When I say acting up, like just weird stuff, things slowing down, almost like 
they're doing something on the back end, which is what they've talked about doing often, right? Going in and dicking around with the uh, the DNS servers. That could cause a big problem. I mean, that's like the backbone of the internet. But anyway, I just I keep noticing that I keep having issues when it comes to internet connectivity, and I don't have a weak internet connection. I actually have super high speed internet out of uh, uh, out of the, the the hosts here, like on the night shift. I know I have the fastest internet. Uh, there are times that usually I I'll host the you know a call on a back end for another host sometimes without even being on air, but uh, you know I'll be hosting it from my Skype because I just ha- you know I have that strong internet connection. So I don't know. I have to get my hacker buddies back on and ask them because there's some, there's something definitely weird going on. I just keep noticing there's little things uh, you know in the Matrix when you see the you'd see things twice. You see a glitch. It was usually uh, there was something something wrong. Something was rewritten. There was a problem with the program, right? Uh, well, that's that's what I keep seeing. I, see, I keep seeing that black cat twice. I keep seeing little things here and there, little glitches in the matrix. I don't know. So just uh, there's any other hackers out there besides the guys that I you know I chat with and bring on the uh, radio show. If you guys are just listeners or anything, and you have an idea as to what might be going on, you can feel free to uh, hit me up. You can either hit me up over at uh, Facebook. We have a fan page, you know, Fed Jack. That's the fan page, Fed Jack. Or you can email me, contact DTRH at yahoo.com. So the full word, contact DTRH at yahoo.com. When I give out that email, people always think I'm saying, like, contact me at. D-. No, 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 no. The full email is the word, contact. DTRH at yahoo.com. If you have any uh, questions, if you have any comments, you have anything to offer, you have any little tidbits of news, you have anything uh, you want to throw my way, especially if you're if you're a hacker um, and you know what's going on with the, if you have any idea, maybe some some inside information as to what's going on. Even if you're not a hacker, you're an IT professional, whatever you do. Uh, if maybe you don't want to be called a hacker, um, if you have any idea as to what could be going on, hit me up. I'm interested to uh, pick your brains and hear it because I think, honestly, I think something is going on. I think they're they're screwing with it on the back end. Anyway, uh, let me get back to what I was chatting about before the break interrupted me. Before I lose my train of thought, otherwise I will because I have about five other things I want to get onto tonight. And hour number two, I'm going to be discussing D.B. Cooper, so stay tuned for that. If you guys heard the broadcast on Saturday from Hangar 18... Uh, you will know why I'm referencing D.B. Cooper now, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit deeper into the second hour. Uh, tomorrow night, I'll, I'll plug it now, I think tomorrow night we're doing uh, Collapse of Palooza, Economic, economic Collapse of Palooza, I think Joe is what, what Joe is calling it. Um, we're going to be hanging out from uh, Change the Channel show, my buddy Ken Webb. Uh, by the way, good job on the InfoWars Nightly News there, getting interviewed last night, Ken. Uh, well done. Plugged Hangar 18. Nice job. Um, we're going to, if I uh, if I remember correctly, tomorrow is Economic Collapse of Palooza, where we're going to be chatting from Ken's show all the way on through to the end of mine. We're going to do like a, uh, I guess a, uh, well, uh, how long is Joe's show? Two hours? Yeah, so five hours, because Ken's is an hour. So yeah, five hour uh, radio thon for economic collapse of Palooza, I think is like I said what Joe called it. Yeah, let me see. I'll tell you right now what he said. Yeah, collapse of Palooza. Okay, I I added the economic collapse part. That's my bad. Okay, so collapse of Palooza tomorrow, because you know Thursday I, I, is the uh, is the deadline, isn't it? Isn't that when we're gonna hit the debt ceiling on Thursday? I I you know I was going to talk about the government shutdown but I guess later but I guess I can bring this up now because I'm talking about the EBT thing. Okay. First of all, let's get something straight. I'm tired of hearing disability veterans benefits and social security being lumped in with entitlements. It's not an effing entitlement, okay? When it comes to social security disability, it, you have to jump through hoops to get it. It's not as easy as they make it out to be. The politicians are like, oh, it's so easy to get it. Bullshit, it's easy to get it, okay? I'll be straightforward with you. No family friendliness right there right now. I'll tell you right how it is. All right, it's a lie. 
75%. You can ask anybody that's ever gone through it. They'll tell you. I asked the Social Security office here in Florida. I spoke to them. I said, how many people? I, and I asked the attorneys around here, local attorneys and stuff too. Okay. Trust me, I've looked into this. Anybody that knows what I'm talking about, anybody that's done any bit of research will know what I'm talking about. They lie. They absolutely lie. Social security disability is not easy to get. Okay, First of all, 75%, 75% of the initial applicants get denied. 75%. And then out of that, maybe 33 to 40% of them get their benefits. Maybe, maybe not even 50%, I would say. If I, if I was going to say 50%, I would say it's being generous. You know why? They make it last forever. And if you don't have an attorney to help expedite, see, if you can afford to get, you know, if you're, or if you're smart enough, like if you go to an attorney like, like Bender and Bender, which is one of these uh, names that, uh, what's his name, Coburn, I think, the, the, the same jagoff that uh, ha- teamed up with the ADL to have uh, Ventura's epi- the Camp FEMA episode of Conspiracy Theory removed from uh, TV. He, he's going after, um, you know, because now there's no money, right? So now they're going after entitlements and everything, or what they call entitlements, right? And they're going after disability and Social Security and everything else. And they're, oh, my God, there's all this fraud, and it's so easy. These people, they have to get these, these you know, it, it's become like a factory for disability, and they, they get these scam artists like Bender and Bender. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not advertising for these guys, okay? They don't pay me or anything, but I know how it works. Okay? It doesn't matter who your attorney is. If a person doesn't get an attorney to represent them, they get ramrodded in the a-hole, okay? I'm not going to be nice and polite about it. I'm going to tell you how it is because they're lying to you, okay? And I'm tired of seeing – there are really sick people out there that need help that get denied this stuff. And then they give food stamps away like they're going out of style to certain people, okay, because they want to reel people in. They need to get those people dependent. They need an army of dependents. That way they can turn around. I mean how many people now are blaming the Republicans? Oh, them damn Republicans. We don't have our food stamps because of them. Mm, gee, it's not the Republicans, morons. It's both parties. But no, you don't realize that because that's not what the media tells you. And your stipend has been cut off. And they, they you know, the people when you, when you go, whoa, whoa, what happened? All the fingers point to one, one or you know, one group or one specific group, and everybody runs and attacks it. Okay, just it, it, that's that's what the 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 whole little EBT uh, slave. That's why. But I stopped using that sh- stuff. The the EBT card. I told you, my wife had food stamps and. Uh, we, we don't, you, I'm glad we, we, she could qualify for it. Okay. We could, because I don't make we, but I'm disabled and she, you know, she doesn't make a bazillion dollars. We, we, I, we, I'll make a way, I'll find a way I'll eat whatever. I'll just eat smaller portions or I won't eat and make sure she does. I don't care. I'm not going to be, you know, I, I already am forced to deal with them because I, I'm a disabled vet. I do not want to be, uh, stuck on the EBT, uh, you know, slave uh, gravy train no thank you i i'd rather figure out a way on my own because you those people are eventually going to have to figure out a way anyway on their own because i mean obviously that they, they had a quote unquote glitch in the system right and oh my god all hell broke loose people were going to walmart and literally people who had 49 cents by the way this goes to show you the the honesty and the integrity of people right people who had 49 cents on their accounts went and loaded up carts literally one woman uh, while i guess the, when the ebt thing came back on they were able to check her account she had 49 cents in her account but like 700 dollars worth of groceries in the cart oh well, i didn't know and you know what this is what really pisses me off and, and i i think a lot of this this is why I think some of this with the whole EBT thing, and I have to look into this further, but there's something shady about it. Okay, there's just certain things going on. Like they said the EBT card system, they said that it was a glitch and it was a test or something that they were doing that Xerox was doing, and that's why there was a problem, and uh, it had nothing to do with the government shutdown and all this other stuff. It, it was coincidental, then it just so happened to happen at the same time. I, 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 I doubt that. I think that was done to ra- uh, ratchet up the tensions, if you want to know the truth. 
uh, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that they're trying to uh, poke the tiger. They're trying to shake the hornet's nest, as it were. You know, they they have a hornet's nest inside of a clear box, and right now they're shaking the living shit out of it. And they're gonna they're they're about to just open the lid and run because they got full on beekeeping suits. So they don't care. But none of us do. And this is this whole thing is this whole thing is a joke. It it, it really is. Anyway, um. Back to the disability rant really quick so I can finish that up. When people go for disability, if they don't have an attorney, okay, their chances of getting their disability are pushed back, uh, you know, and uh, it's it, – it, I don't even know how to describe it in numbers. The chance of them getting it, uh, if they get it, is very nil, and it's going to take five, six, seven. I've seen people waiting eight to ten years for a disability rating because they don't want to go to an attorney or they can't afford an attorney. Now, w- luckily, one of the, some of the ways that these attorneys work is uh, you get a um, a uh, when you get your disability, they'll give you a um, a retroactive check for I think it's max is two years. So if you get a even if you've been disabled ten and waiting for ten, they only give you a retroactive check for two years. Yeah, welcome to the government. They they're scumbags like that. But anyway, uh, they give you a retroactive check. It goes back two years. Out of that retroactive check is what the they'll, they'll take, you know, whatever you agree to. It's usually, I think the max they're allowed to take is like 30% or 33%. But that's, and some lawyers will go lower. It all depends, but that's that's usually what they take. Now, and that's an, then that's it. They don't get any more out of the monthly Social Security check. They get, you know, bam, one shot out of it. So if they don't, if the person doesn't get their disability, they don't get paid. So of course it's going to behoove them to you know get the person paid. And yes, there are shady judges that help push things through with other law firms here and there and stuff like that. But for the most part, and I can tell you when the the, the lawmakers are up there, they have they are so disconnected they have no effing clue what they're talking about. It is not easy for people to cheat and get disability. It's just not. In fact, it's so damn hard. I know people that deserve disability that they can't get it. I know two women off the top of my head that totally deserve to have disability benefits without a shadow of a doubt, okay, and they, 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 they don't have it. You know why? Because the government, when they applied for it, the government told them insufficient work history. What kind of crap is that? I thought disability was for people that could not work. Uh, isn't that what we're sold? Isn't that what we're told? Oh, that's for people that can't work. Yeah, but you didn't pay into the system enough to be considered to be able to get any money because you know you're whatever you know you didn't work long enough so if you worked a job where you got paid cash you got paid off the books for a couple of years maybe and then you get you get disabled and now you got to go on disability you're likely not going to get it because you have an insufficient work history for the past few years i'm not kidding i'm not faking this this isn't make make up you know make believe land this is real so it's not easy for people to get disability. And yeah, there are people that do cheat. The problem is when you get people like Coburn who are looking to trim money any way they can, they look for people like that. And that's a shining example of douchebaggery. Okay, so they find a shining example of of they 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 find a you know, they they find one of these horrific doctors that steals money. You know, bi- you know, bilks the government out of you know millions and millions of dollars, and I say horrific because it's not really, you know, whatever he ripped the government off, <laughs> whatever. I mean, that's that's tax money. But I'm talking about what he does to the patients, because what happens to the patients is once that doctor is under scrutiny, I guarantee you, anybody that got a disability decision rating by either him or, like in one case, there's a judge that they they nail. There's more than one case, but like in a case where they nail a judge doing the same thing. Any rating that that judge or that that doctor or you know an attorney whoever had uh, that they had a connection to is now going to get all dragged back up and they're going to go through it again with a fresh you know set of eyes. And I guarantee you, if these people who are now maybe they've been getting disability five six years and okay, you know if you're a doctor and you see a thousand people and you did some shady stuff for fifty of them, 
Well, the other 950 are going to pay for that because maybe they really are disabled people and they really do genuinely need the disability benefits. See, this stuff isn't, look, I get pissed off about this because they're not, it's not an entitlement. They, when they talk about Social Security and disability like it's entitlement, like, let, me, let, me, let me explain something to the younger crowd so you fully understand something. When you get a paycheck, I know you might not understand this. See, my mom explained this to me when I was a kid. I know the younger generations now, they don't, they don't have time for that because Justin Bieber's on or whatever. But if you look on your check, you pay into Social Security each month, Okay. Or each week, or each two weeks, whatever it is that you get paid, you know, you get every time you get a paycheck, you pay into Social Security. So it's not really an entitlement if you're taking money out of your check each week. Technically, it's supposed to be a savings account. But you see, about fifty years ago, what they did was maybe a little under fifty years ago. What what Lyndon Johnson probably about forty five years ago, whatever. Starting back in the, the during the, the Johnson administration, they moved everything over. Okay, so it wasn't no it was no longer this social security fund just for social security. Because if left alone, there'd be a ton of money in there. There'd be a ton of money for people to retire for disability, for you know, did people be able to retire at fifty five? But no, 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 no. You can't do that. You cannot have that. No, no, stop it. You can't do that. So what they do is they went and they raided the account because they needed money because politicians like to spend money, right? They can't get money from Congress. They can't get money one way. They'll do it another, right? Whether it's running illegal drugs via the CIA or however they get their money, they'll, they'll do it because they're scumbags. And what, just like with all these other accounts, they raided the account. There's nothing in there, okay? The money was switched over to the general fund, and the general fund is what they piss money away on. So... Technically, your Social Security money is what pays for Barack Obama uh, and his family to fly around. It's what pays for Michelle Obama's credit cards. Yes, it is. Because all of that money gets pulled together pretty much into one big fund, and then they piss it away like, hey, it's going out of style. They don't care. That's why there's no money for Social Security. When they say, oh, my God, we don't have any money to pay for Social Security. Well, you would if you had left it alone and not put your damn hands on it. But you, you had to touch it. And people were okay with it because, hey, they're politicians. They know better than us. So that's the problem. Hmm. Where have I seen that before? Oh, the post office. That's right. They have to pay 75 years into the future for their, for their benefits, right? Bush passed that law. One of the last things he, uh, he did, the last few years he was in office, he passed the law. It says the post office. This is why the post office has financial problems. They didn't have financial problems till before this, or until after this, rather. Uh, they... They have to pay seventy five. Uh, they have to pay for benefits for future retirees seventy five years into the future. They had to pay it into an account. Post office said, "You know, hey, we we overpaid." And you can go look this up. This is like eight nine months ago at least. Post office said, "Hey, we overpaid. You know, we need some of that money back because that would help us with our financial difficulties. It would help us, you know, with everything we need. And it, we wouldn't have to lay people off or let anybody go or you know force early retirement on anybody. So we want some of that back now." They said that they had overpaid, and if I remember, now I, I'm going, you know, off my memory from eight months ago. Ben Swan did a piece about this. Uh, if I remember correctly, they said they overpaid by seventy-five billion dollars. That, but, that, but uh, I want you to re just think about that. Just, I'm going to repeat that. I want you to think about that. Seventy. They said something like, if I remember correctly, it was seventy-five billion. Now, if they overpaid. By seventy five million. How much was in the damn account? I mean, what was in there? So they went to the, the post office, you know, goes to whoever, Congress, Feds, whatever, says, Hey, we want that money. It helps out. You know what they said? We don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? Oh, we don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? Where'd it go? Oh well, you know, we spent on other things. There's a lot of in there. You see, when Congress when the government, whatever you want to, you know, Congress is just one part of it. But whenever we, the government makes a savings account, uh, people always think of it in the simplest of terms. A jar with a lid. You throw your money in it, and you put the lid on the jar. And they think that if they put the lid on tightly, that the money will never leave the jar. Well, in a normal situation, that's true. Unfortunately, in government bank accounts, there's always a little back door that you don't know about. 
And that back door is where they open up and they go in and they pull out, a, you know, a fiver here or a, you know, a ten here. That's what they do. You know, if you if you had a a a glass jar filled with money, right? And say at the bottom there was a little trick, little secondary trick, you know, lid or whatever built into the bottom, a little hole you could maybe with a plug that you could unplug the hole and reach your finger up into the piggy bank there, the glass jar piggy bank. And you 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 have a hundred dollars saved up in there, and over the course of time you start taking out a dollar here, and a dollar there, and five dollars here, and ten dollars there, and twenty five dollars here. Really fast, what happens? Your savings is gone. Oh, so what do you do? You just take a piece of paper and put I O U five bucks and throw it in there. I O U twenty five bucks and throw it in. There. Hey, that's good, right? That's what our government does. So when they say, oh, we don't have any money, we need to raise the debt ceiling, blah, 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 that's what they're talking about. They don't have any money. None. They, the only reason, you, this ought to be apparent to you. If they don't keep borrowing, they can't keep spending. And yet, we dole money out to our, our foreign friends, give them millions of dollars. Hey, Israel, here's some money. Hey, Egypt. Oh, we just finally stopped giving Egypt foreign aid. Really? I mean... You know, color me kooky, but weren't we in a sequester, supposedly? Su sequester? I'm doing air quotes, sequester. Where'd, the, where, where, where'd that money come from? They don't have the money to take care of sick veterans who are jacked up because of your lies and you're sending them over to foreign countries and to fight for BS and you know, make you guys money. You don't have money to take care of the sick in the country. Oh, Popeye, that's socialist. No, actually, you know, we'd be able to get health care for people in this country with like a quarter of the money we've spent on war in the past 12 years. But hey, I'm, I'm the jerk off because, you know, that would be a sensible way to spend money, right? What has war gotten us? We've spent billions for war, and what have we gained from it? Tell me one strategic gain that we got from all these wars that we spent billions of dollars on and killed millions of people around the world and pissed off pretty much the whole world and wrecked our name around the world. Then again, maybe that was the plan the whole time. I've said this before. You know, Germany and its people got demonized. For allowing, you know, after World War II, for allowing uh, the things that the Nazis did uh, to go on and to, for allowing them to, you know, just gain the amount of power they did. The German people were held responsible for that. Who do you think is going to be held responsible when it hits the fan and maybe there's some world government and their first world governing authority, uh, you, you know, their their first uh, the first ceremonial gesture of power, I guess you could say, is to come after the United States for their crimes against humanity worldwide. And you say, well, you can get the the leaders, the politicians, but they're elitists. They fly off, they disappear, they go to some neutral country where they're okay. Who's left holding the bag? for all the financial burden that these guys spent money on. You think Obama is going to be, in four years, you think he's going to be around worried about your checkbook? No. He's going to be getting a retirement check for the rest of his life. They make like $200,000 or something like that for the rest of their life. Benefits. Secret Service protection. What do you get? He sells out you, your kids, and all these politicians like that. They, they'll sell you out. They'll sell your whole family out. They'll sell this country out, and then they're gone. Who's going to be left holding the bag? Who do you think is going to be responsible for all this? You certainly don't think it's going to be them, do you? Because it's not. It's going to be you, me, and everybody else that's here. But, 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 but I didn't tell them to bomb another country. I was busy watching American Idol. That's precisely the problem. And the rest of the world will understand that because they'll look at it with logic and say, you could have done something, you should have done something, but you didn't. You sat on your butt.
And there's a lot of division, too, I noticed. There's a lot of people blaming the Republicans and nuts. I mean, the Republicans are idiots. They're doing a lot of stupid things, but they obviously don't know how to manage their PR at all. They obviously, their PR skills are... Phew. Obamacare's been, what, three weeks roll out, and they've been having nothing but problems. Nobody can sign up. It's a huge failure. I mean, even even Robert Gibbs is like, somebody should be fired. Sebelius should be fired for this. Day. I mean, Ryan, Robert Gibbs is a D-bag, right? But that's not what's getting focused on, right? The, the point, you know, they're, they're fighting, quote-unquote, for Obamacare, but, they, you know, they, this whole fight is about, about Obamacare and the debt ceiling. They, they, they don't even know what they're arguing about anymore. So that's why I think this whole thing, I mean, obviously it's it's show, but I think there's something, I don't know. There's just more going on. There's always more going on. Anyway, the top of the hour break is sneaking up on us. We get back, I'm going to get into D.B. Cooper. And a few other things. And I'll play the, uh, I'll play the audio for you that I, I've had queued up and I just did not play for you. The EBT rioters and then we'll get into db cooper and more so stay tuned don't go anywhere three minutes ladies and gentlemen we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of down the rabbit hole i am your host popeye from federaljack.com it is october 15th 2013 hour number two i'm gonna be getting into a few things but i wanna i know i was ranting last segment and uh next thing i knew we were actually i ranted right out of time and i wanted to I'll play you this audio clip that I was talking about when I was talking about, you know, entitlement programs, and I, 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 and I got off on the, the a rant a little bit. I w- I did say that I was going to play some audio of the uh, of food stamp recipients in Los Angeles threatening to riot if they don't get their food stamps. Now, again, people could say, well, you know, they're you know, let them fill a stereo. Let them fit a stereotype. Well, they're it's they're, they're animals, or they're this because I've seen the comments all over the place already. It, you don't get it. You're being played because now you're taking a side. So it's you versus them. Get it? So mission accomplished, genius. Okay. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have that herd mentality of you know feeding at the government trough uh, if the government wasn't handing it out and willing to you know give it to them and bring them in and reel them in. I mean, yes, some of there are some people that are inherently lazy and it, you know, there are people that will allow them that will allow themselves to fit into a stereotype. Uh but don't fall into the the mire as it is and think that oh, you know, it's a, it's as simple as that. It's 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 that simple. It's you know, they're just it's certain minorities and they're they're animals and because that's those are the comments I've been seeing and that's uh, it, again, it's a way of keeping us separated. You have to look at the bigger picture. There are, by the way, there's a lot of white people, uh, not just uh, minorities, as, people would, uh, as some of these idiots are saying out there. Uh, yes, you might see videos of uh, maybe black people or, you know, if there's Latinos around getting pissed off or rioting, but uh, I'm sure I'm willing to bet there's probably white trash jagoffs doing the same thing. Okay. It's got nothing to do with race. It's got nothing to do with color. It's got nothing to do with any of that. Okay, what if you look at the bigger picture? It's the government getting humans, other people, dependent on them, creating this whole army of dependents. Okay, so that way, when it hits the fan, you know, I mean, look, they could turn around now and say, if they wanted to, say, say the food stamps went off, and everybody started rioting. Can you imagine if? The president came on TV because he loves to do this. He loves to interject himself personally. What would he? What, what would happen if he went on and said, "You know, I've tried to help you guys, but the Republicans in the Congress, the Republicans in the Tea Party, just don't like black people and don't want you people to have uh, EBT food stamp cards, or they don't like Latinos, or they don't like wh- whatever." Say somebody came on and did that, or say they said they don't like people on food stamps. Period. They think you're all scum, or something to that effect, and they they. They riot. They they you know stoke the the flames of fury, which they've been doing. Okay. Now they have this army of pissed off people, and they say, "Well, you know what? If maybe if we go and you know, all they have to do is not so much go do this, but you know, maybe if they weren't there, or if if whatever, they'll put the idea in their head and then let them run with it." Okay. 
And who knows what kind of mayhem, mayhem and chaos could ensue. And then, of course, because now you have chaos, what, what comes out of chaos? Oh, that's right, their order. Oh, I get it. So first you create an army of dependents, an army of people throughout this whole country, whether they be black, white, red, purple with polka dots. Okay, there's a lot of middle class people that are on food stamps and can't feed their kids either. A lot of, there are a lot of veterans that take food stamps. So what happens when you cut all that off? Now you have this army of pissed off people. And may, maybe if you stoke the fires right, you get them to riot. And then once they riot, oh, look, people are getting pissed off. Oh, look, we have an excuse for martial law in the police state. And then, well, once martial law is declared, then they can say things like, oh, well, you know, we have to enact special legislation and special rules and blah, 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 blah. Okay? It could go that fast. It could slide down that fast. Okay? And that's part of their plan. They need to make this country, they need to make the people of this country very dependent on them. Because we have not always been that way, but the country is slowly turning into that. And yes, there are people that will allow themselves to fit into a stereotype, but people should also educate themselves and know that each quote-unquote race of humans, which we're all just one race, the human race, but each will say, each little label that the powers that shouldn't be want to divide us up into, uh, e each little section, uh, you know, they've, they've tried to have little separate sections of society and keep everybody sectioned off like that. Well, they, they also target each individual section of society uh, with different ways of keeping them separated and breaking them down, Okay. I, I could do a whole broadcast about this. I've done this. What do you think the, the gangster rap uh, was for? What do you think? You know, crack. Well, who do you think it was targeted towards? It was tar targeted towards the black community. Cocaine was targeted towards the rich white people because cocaine was a rich white person's drug back in the 80s and it was too expensive. So in order to destroy the black community, because they had to, because you could never allow someone like a Martin Luther King Jr. or... Uh, I mean, look, you, even Cornell West, and I don't agree with everything Cornell West says, but I have to say the guy's the guy he he speaks truth to power, whether or not you agree with him or not, and everything is is, is irrelevant. He speaks truth to power, and a lot of you won't find people like him anymore. He called Al Sharpton out, you know, flat out called them out a couple months back. You don't see that anymore, and they don't want that. They want people. They they want to break up each individual section of society into the into their own label, their own stereotypical label that they've created and then programmed into us over the course of time. And they do that because it's it, it enables them to do a lot of things. It enables them to control society as a whole, keep us fighting amongst each other. Okay, and it also stops any any future. Uh, leaders, any future real leaders, people the, from coming out from any any branch, whether it's it, you know whether it's white people, Latino people, uh, black people, Asian people, it doesn't matter. Does not matter. They will target. Uh, they've. It's almost like after you know after the sixties, you could see into the seventies. They they literally started to target all these different sections of society to keep every one of them down. And now they food stamps. You know, back in the day, people. I remember when I was a kid, people would be like, "Oh, food stamps are for poor people. They're for they're for losers. It's for those are for the minorities." Now, food. You know, half the country's on food stamps, if not more. A lot of middle class white families are on it. So the stereotypes need to get thrown away. We need to get rid of all that. We need to stop fighting amongst ourselves and saying, oh, that's only for black people. That's only for Latino people. They're dirty. Or that's only for white trash people. Or whatever. Because we, I like to be, I like to argue and be separated from everybody else. It, look, the food stamp thing is a prime example. They've got, they're getting everybody onto the government cheese, and then they retract the government cheese and get everybody rioting, and then bring in their order out of the chaos that they've created. See how simple it is to destroy this country now? Because everybody is dependent on the government. They run to the government. Oh, help me, help me, please, please. I mean, I had a fight to get my veterans' benefits, and by the way. So people understand something. When it comes to veterans' benefits, veterans are not welfare whores like a lot of people like to say. Oh, freaking veterans are just welfare whores. Veterans sign a contract. You go to MEPS, you sign a contract, okay? Just like any other contract, which is they, they have to honor it, okay? Under law, they have to honor the contract, okay? And that's why veterans and their families get pissed off because veterans honor their contract and their oath. They go and they do what they're supposed to do, okay? Even if they don't want to do it, even regardless of all that other political stuff, anything, they, they, 
the, the basic premise is they sign a contract, they agree to do a job, and if they're hurt, and not all veterans get benefits, but if they're hurt or if they're affected by their service, then you know, yeah, due to them via that contract, via the contract, it's in writing, it's a contract that we have with the government that if we get hurt, they have to take care of us. Believe me, I can speak, I know I speak for myself and I know I speak for many other veterans. We would rather be fully functioning, normal human beings, okay? They don't pay disabled veterans anything. And once you're a disabled vet, you can't, it's not like you can go out and, um, you know, if you're, if you're getting a disability check, you can't go out and get a job because then they would take your disability check away. They would say, oh, you must be good enough to work now. See, the whole premise behind being disabled is you're no longer an efficient worker. You're no longer an efficient worker B. You are no longer an efficient robot to the system. Get it? Okay? But see, the, 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 a lot of people, I, I just, I had to throw that VA thing out there really quick because a lot of people say, I've heard the comments, well, veterans are just welfare horse. No, they're not. They signed a freaking agreement. Okay? And again, Social Security is not a freaking entitlement. And disability is not an entitlement either. Okay? Because you pay into that stuff when you work. You pay into it. It's taken out of your check. So if technically, if you're paying into it, it's not an entitlement. Technically, you're, it's like more like an insurance program or a savings account. I mean, and you can, uh, you can argue the semantics of, of you know, what label fits whatever, but seriously, it's not an entitlement. Now, food stamps, that's an entitlement. I don't really like food stamps, and I, I, I have explained this before. My wife and I... Uh, back in the day when it, things were even rougher than they are now. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it, 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 things are always pretty hairy when you're a disabled vet and you can't work. But it's, uh, uh, it was even rougher. There was a period of time where we were, we were pretty much almost homeless. And um, it, we, if it weren't for the food stamps, because I was fighting the VA for my benefits at the time, and if it weren't for, uh, or her food stamps, I didn't have them. If it weren't for her food stamps, neither one of us would have eaten. And, um, I did notice that, and, and not that we spent money on stuff we didn't need, but I noticed that it, it gave us, having that food stamp card gave us this false sense of security. Oh, you know, we'll have, we'll always have, uh, and they only give you like 200 bucks a month, by the way. People think, oh, you get five, six, seven hundred dollars a month. Wrong. You get like 200 bucks a month if you're lucky. It's like the most. So you would, you would get this false sense of security of always having that there. And then, Every six months, you'd have to renew, and usually once, you know, in the the, the time that she had it, uh, I think one time things went smooth. Usually when you have to renew, because they make you redo the renew process every six months, I've seen a lot of times where the renewal process takes so long because the system is so defunct and people that work there are so useless, and just utterly, completely useless, that by the time, you know, six months, it, it, you're, you, you'd be lucky if you get food stamps, you should start reapplying for, you know, the food stamps then. And it, at the end of the six months when your food stamps is up, you, it'll probably be going through and, and kicking back in. Otherwise, I've seen people get food stamps for six months and then it takes six months for them to reapply because of the whole nature of the bureaucratic red tape crap. And that... Going from having them to not having them is a big shock for people, especially when you've had them for six months. You, after six months, you've become programmed, trained, because now you depend on that stuff. And you take that away. You're better off not using them. I'm telling you, you're better off not using them. You're better off figuring something out. Look, if you're smart, as most of you are, Okay, there's there are some nincompoops out there, but most of you are smart. Most look, most of the intelligence has been, you know, pushed down and purposely uh, retarded. And I, I have faith that humanity can pull its head out of its rear end, but they 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 need to to realize what's going on. They need to realize that there is a problem and that they don't know things. Part of that, the other part of that problem is people don't want to admit that there's a problem. That's the ego thing. Oh, there's no problem. I don't know what you're talking about. We've never had an issue. Mm. You don't need food stamps. Well, yes, we do, Popeye. How how else are we going to live? You know, my wife and you know my my kids. You know, we we subsidize our food with the food stamp program. Uh, you know, it's expensive. Well, what are you guys driving around? Well, I have this huge house. 
and our mortgage is super expensive, and then, of course, we have our two cars. Well, you think you're overextending yourself? My wife and I have one vehicle. We share it. We share one vehicle. Is it a pain in the butt? You bet you. Do we make it work? Yes, we do. Because we can't afford two cars. Can't afford two insurance payments. Can't afford two car payments. Got a small little little uh, wind-up toy car. Eats no gas. It's comfortable. Works for me. Practical enough that I can use it to do certain things that I need to do, which is fine by me. We split the bill. Don't pay much for it. And that's that. I don't live beyond my means, and she doesn't live beyond hers. My wife doesn't go out. She's got, uh, you know, a, a, a de- debit card, credit card, whatever you want to call it. She doesn't go out and piss her money away. She has to live within her means. We have a certain budget. Food, water, rent, electricity. Those are the necessities. They come first. Everything else after that is a luxury item. I have clothes that are 10, 15 years old. No kidding. I have t-shirts that are old as dirt. I have friends that bust my balls and say to me, why do you keep that stuff, Popeye? Why don't you get rid of it and get new stuff? It's not in fashion anymore. Because I didn't grow up being in fashion. I grew up getting hand-me-down clothes, and if I did get new clothes, I had to make them last. My mom used to make a lot of my clothes and my brother's clothes and her own clothes. She made Halloween costumes. I would get hand-me-down pants. She'd hem them so they would fit me, and they would look like they were store-bought. We found a way. So I grew up not chasing designer labels or anything like that. I don't, I don't need to spend money that I don't have. I don't need to live beyond my means. And I, look, I know the economy sucks. And I know I'm not chastising people for taking food stamps. What I'm trying to get across is you need to figure out a way to get off of them if you're on them. Because eventually they're going to go by the by. And you're going to be up, you know, crap creek without a paddle. And then what are you going to do? Because you're not prepared. And when, when, we, when she stopped getting food stamps uh, you know, years ago, I said to her, I'm glad that you stopped getting them because now it, it forces us, even though we, we were not in the greatest of situations, it still forced me to rely on my own keen instincts and my own wit to solve the problem. I didn't rely on the government. See, that food stamp card, it, again... Uh, it, and if it's it, even if it's you know whatever, it, it, when it comes to stuff like that, it, it, whatever you want to call it, a, the EBT card, even if it was something else, if they were give, literally giving out government cheese, it'd be the same thing. They, they you get this false sense of security from, it, and it's not always going to be there. And when it's gone, you don't know what to do. And people are usually caught off guard. I mean, look at how they re, look at how they reacted with the food stamp thing, it, with the EBT cards going offline. Their their supposed little glitch, yeah. We were testing this the system. I don't I don't I don't know. I don't want to like say that there's a conspiracy here or there because I don't have the evidence this but it just uh it, to me it's like they do they did it on purpose to ratchet up fear and to stir up the pot. They they have to. They have to just just ratchet it up a little bit more. Ratchet it up a little bit more. A little bit more. It, that's what it seemed to me anyway. Here this is the audio from when uh uh uh, World Star Hip Hop, I think it's called, went down there to uh, to interview some of the people. And, and just listen, and you can hear it. I mean, I understand things might be tough, but listen, you can hear it in their voice how dependent they are on the government. Uh, that's not good, ever. And we're down in South Central uh, Los Angeles, Skid Row area today. Uh, we have a crisis going on. Uh, the EBT system, which is the electronic banking system that provides food stamps and cash benefits to homeless men and women, uh, the system is shut, totally shut down in the state of California since 12 p.m. last night. Today, the system is still down, and no one that receives EBT cash or food stamps can use this system to access any food or cash. That's homeless families. 
homeless families. Uh, they love to say they they love to use that 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 uh, the homeless family thing. They love to say, oh, it's the you know that they, they keep saying it throughout this thing. That the guy keeps saying, I had to stop it for a second. He keeps saying, uh, oh, you know, homeless people. Uh, there's lots of homeless families that get EBT cards, and that's true. That that's true. Okay, I I get that the homeless people. The, I okay, them getting food stamps. Okay, I can understand that. But like the dude doing the interview, and I don't know if he's got his own food stamp card, but he was holding one up, and it could have been someone else's, but he was holding one up in his hand, and he's all decked out. He's got a brand new hat on with the tag. You know, they 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 leave the tags. That's the the fashion thing that they leave the tags hanging in, and the brims all straight. Look, brand new hat, like it's off the shelf. Uh. Big fat watch on his wrist. Nice, nice shirt. You know, nice pair of jeans. I mean, probably one hundred and fifty dollars worth of clothes on him, at least, right? So, and he's got an EBT card in his hand. Now, I don't know if that, I can't say that that's his because I don't know. But I mean, if that's his EBT card, don't you think that's a little messed up? If if that's his card, and he's sitting there acting like you know, oh, the, the, you know, nobody's got any food, nobody's got any nothing, and here he is. So anyway, I don't know if it's his card, but they're, they're, just listen to the listen to the level that we're at in this country right now. Now again, we had homeless people and stuff, you know, 200 years ago, 236 years ago. But this is not what this country. This isn't the grand experiment. What you're about to hear is not the grand experiment that our founding fathers had the had you know in mind when they created this country. Regular families that are not homeless, anybody using the EBT card cannot use their card. This is a major situation that's going unnoticed. World Star is first on the scene to report this crisis, and we're going to talk to people downtown in Skid Row to see what their opinion of the situation is as to why the EBT system is down and how it affects them, which is most important. So we're going to pan over to our left here. We're going to approach the people over there and just see what they have to say. Come along with me. You know, it's, it's, it's twisted and crazy because it's rough and tough out here, man. You know what I mean? This is kind of street streets right here. It's, it's hard down here, anywhere, anywhere in urban America, it's hard. And for them to do what they did and, and make it to a point where nothing is coming through right now, I mean, what they expect? It's a setup. It's all a setup. It's a gimmick. It's a setup. You know what I'm saying? They, they, it's like the horse, the carrot in the horse. You know, they show you the carrot, they get you to moving for a minute, and then they snatch it away, and then it's like they take your, your feet from up under you. Some people can handle it, some people can't. You know, some of us have choices, and a lot of these people down here don't have no choices. You know, so the resources and the things that they... That's a cop-out, by the way. They don't have a choice. You always have a choice. Well, I got to eat, so I'm going to rob that guy over there, and I'm going to kill him and take his money and his clothes and stuff because I need it, because I need to survive. But I don't have a choice. You do have a choice. You chose to do that. You weren't forced to do it. So that's the problem. Every, nobody wants to take personal freaking responsibility. Man, nobody's got choices. Look, you know what? I understand if someone's homeless and they're they're, they're they're things they're destitute and things like that. Okay, but you see how he's we we there's people out here that don't have any choices. They have no choices. Yes, you always have a choice. That's the problem. We're told that no, you don't have a choice. Our options are limited right off the bat. It's either this, that, or none. It's always A or B. Or you don't have any other choices. So if they don't get food stamps, now again, if they're homeless, I can understand giving somebody that's homeless food stamps over, uh, you know, some. Uh, I, I sometimes I, I just get pissed off because I've seen people that shouldn't have food stamps, that don't need them, have food stamps, and then I see people that totally deserve to have them, that should, that need them, can't get them. Uh, it's the topsy turvy world we live in. But anyway. Let's get back to the audio. This is definitely not the, the grand experiment that the Founding Fathers had in uh, mind. I can tell you that. They give us is limited. And then when they do give it to us, it's limited. And then they just take it. Or they play a game with you. I feel like my heart goes out to the families and stuff who don't have food right now. Because you know, some people leave their money on a car. So they asked out too. I really feel bad for my heart goes out too. We had to cancel a picnic today because we were going to use EBT cards to buy hamburgers and stuff. We had to cancel. What picnic? At the Rotary House? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, the veterans were going to do something. Yeah, we were going to throw a happy little cookout and stuff. We couldn't do it. 
a lot of us who are not, you know, up on what's happening or the current events as far as the uh, EBT system is concerned, you know, we're baffled and we don't know what to do, so we're stuck. We don't eat, we don't drink, we don't, we don't. They better resolve something because if it stays like this, there's going to be an uproar in the city of LA. Like what? A Rodney King, baby. All again, right? Yep. Riots over food stamps. They're creating the chaos. Oh, well, these they're animals, bye bye. Stop it. Stop it. You're getting you're getting mired down into you know a straw man argument. Red herring, if you will. Stop it. Look at the bigger picture. They've gotten the people in this country. A percentage of them, a large percentage, we'll say like almost 50%, stuck on this government food stamp program now, right? It's unsustainable. All of this stuff is unsustainable. I mean, Social Security is not unsustainable. All that stuff, that could actually, if left alone and not screwed with it, everything would have been fine. Uh, We can't do all of this. We can't do Obamacare, Social Security as it is, veterans benefits, everything. We can't do all this and then war giving money away to foreign countries. We literally have nothing in the savings account. Okay, We have nothing but IOUs, and our government runs on every couple months we have to raise the debt limit to keep borrowing more money. But we're never going to pay back the money that we're borrowing. I don't think you understand that. There's a lot of people that don't get that. We already can't pay back the money that we've borrowed. So this, all this stuff is unsustainable. Of course, if we weren't running around for 12 years doing things like bombing everybody else's backyard, perhaps we could afford it. But, uh... No, I can't have that. That, that, would, that would be, you know, that would be smart. We're going to break. Stay tuned. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment of tonight's live edition Seems to have exercised the gremlins for the evening, at least so far. Oh, frustrating. Operating on a uh, a shoestring budget, uh, I make. I I've learned over the years to make things work, even when they break. Uh, whether it be uh, through rigging it or whatever I have to do. So after I get off air, I'm going to have to tear my computer apart and have a little chat with it. Because I do not have the money to build a new one right now. I am slowly trying to uh, build a new one here and there. I'm going to acquire the parts to do it, but it's probably going to take me six or eight months because I'm broke. And, hey, who knows? Now that uh, now that I'm not paying veterans, uh, I might be homeless in a few weeks. But uh, I will still broadcast. I'll just broadcast on the side of the street. <laughs> ah, I had a vent. Anyway, I want to move on. I'm tired of ranting tonight. I want to get into the last half hour here. I want to get into something interesting. Something very, very interesting. On Saturday, I was doing Hangar 18 with Joe and Ken and uh, a slew of other hosts. It was actually a really good broadcast. I think we had like five or six people in there at one point. It was really good. You should go check it out in the archive section. But I brought up D.B. Cooper and that's because earlier in the day I had stumbled across not even looking for it. Um, and I remember now that I think about it, I remember the, the one lady that who says uh, she's his niece. I remember her coming out on air. And uh, I'm actually trying to track her down uh, for an interview. And there's a guy you're going to hear, one of the voices you're going to hear, and the audio I'm going to play is an author. Uh, he's talking, he's uh, an author of a book called Skyjack. That's all about the, uh, the case of D.B. Cooper. And it's it's loaded with uh, all this information. Uh, I'm actually in. Uh, I was talking to his publicist earlier today, so I'm in the works of getting him on for an interview as well about his book because this is actually something that's really interesting to me. Now a lot of you are going to go, "Who the hell is DB Cooper?" and you're you're going to learn all about him. But it's just interesting because the story of DB Cooper that I had always heard was that you know he had uh, the uh, they they hijacked the plane, you know. He he had the he had uh, forget how much money. I want to say like somewhere on like two hundred thousand dollars or something on him. 
Uh, you know, they hijack a plane uh, and they land, let the people off, take back off, and then in midair he takes the the money and he goes to the back of the plane and it was a specific type of plane that he hijacked because of the, the rear ramp and the rear ramp opens up, he jumps out uh, into history. No one's ever seen him or heard from him again. Uh, the mysterious hijacker known as D.B. Cooper. Uh, and it just, there's connections to uh, the CIA and there's just so much more. It's interesting. His, um, his niece even says, you'll hear her, she says, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, or I didn't start off as a conspiracy theorist, I think is what she says. Uh, you know, she didn't start off this journey, uh, you know, coming from the, the viewpoint of somebody looking for a conspiracy or anything like that. And she just happened to uh, stumble into this. Uh, I, I guess researching, you know, what she had, she had flashbacks and stuff. So, re, you know, upon researching it, um, she she learned what she learned. Now she she talks about a little bit about the flashbacks here, but she's done a couple of news interviews. Her name's Marla Cooper. You can look her up. But uh, I'm going to play this clip. DB Cooper, ladies and gentlemen, the mystery of DB Cooper. It's a lot more interesting than even I realized. That's so why I want to share this with you because I'm going to be doing a couple more broadcasts on this. But uh, I, I thought I'd uh, wet your whistle with this one. Check it out. February 10th, 1980. The Columbia River, near Vancouver, Washington. On a camping trip with his parents, eight-year-old Brian Ingram discovers a strange bundle of decomposing banknotes buried at the water's edge. The cash adds up to $5,800. But where did it come from? It's like every boy's dream found buried treasure. And this treasure was caked in some sand. They're all $20 bills. And when they brought the money to the authorities, they could read some of the serial numbers. The serial numbers reveal that the money was part of a ransom payment. The first physical evidence recovered from the world's only unsolved hijacking nine years earlier. November 24th. 1971. On the evening before Thanksgiving, Northwest Flight 305, a short trip from Portland to Seattle, takes a terrifying turn when a passenger in row 18, listed as Dan Cooper, presses the call button. As soon as the plane took off, he handed the flight attendant a note informing her that he was hijacking the airplane. To show her that he's serious, he reaches for his attache case, and he opens it, and inside she can see wires, and she can see red sticks. She thinks it's a bomb. The hijacker demands four parachutes and $200,000 in cash to be delivered to him when the plane touches down in Seattle. Once he landed and the money was on board, the passengers were released. Nobody was physically harmed in the hijacking. 36 passengers got off the jetliner in Seattle last night, left aboard four crew members and the hijacker. The hijacker wanted to go to Mexico City, but he had these very specific instructions on how the plane should be flown. He wanted it no higher than 10,000 feet. Couldn't go any faster than 200 miles an hour. Furthermore, this was a very unique kind of plane because it had these rear stairs that came out. But passenger Dan Cooper, later known as D.B. Cooper, never made it to Mexico. As the plane flew over southwestern Washington, the hijacker strapped the money to his body, lowered the plane's aft stairs, and jumped. Over the following days and weeks, teams of law enforcement officials scoured the region for any sign of him. But despite the intense efforts, nothing was found. No money, no parachute, and no suspect. The FBI still has an open case on Cooper. He was indicted, so it has not closed the case. There's always a possibility that he could be found. But who was the mysterious passenger known as Dan Cooper? And is there a secret reason why he has never been found? People know this case is the D.B. Cooper case, but really it should be called the Dan Cooper case. 
because Dan Cooper is the name that the hijacker gave when he bought his ticket to board that flight. On the night of the hijacking, a lot of reporters were trying to figure out what was going on. A miscommunication between a journalist and the FBI led to the hijacker's name being reported as D.B. Cooper. The FBI decided not to correct the record, believing it would help them to eliminate suspects. Agents wanted the public to think it was D.B. Cooper because then they could look for Dan Cooper. They could weed out all the clues that would come in about D.B. Cooper. That was their, you know, sort of ace in the hole. More than four decades later, the decaying banknotes found on the edge of the Columbia River remain the only clue to ever surface in the D.B. Cooper case. None of the money that D.B. Cooper received ever showed up in circulation based on the serial numbers that, of course, have been recorded. So that tells you something about whether D.B. Cooper ever survived that parachute jump. If he had, he certainly would have spent the money. But is it possible that money might not have been D.B. Cooper's motive for the hijacking? Or was there another, perhaps more, secret reason? I'm Marla Cooper. I'm the niece of the hijacker known as D.B. Cooper. My uncles Dewey and L.D. planned the hijacking. L.D. was the man on the plane, but Dewey was the man on the ground. In 1971, eight-year-old Marla Cooper was spending Thanksgiving as usual with her family at her grandmother's house in Sisters, Oregon. It was there that her two uncles, after years of struggling to get by, boasted about coming into a large sum of money. And I heard my uncle Dewey tell my father that we were rich, our money problems are over. Um, we just had to go back and find the money. Um, but he said, we did it. We hijacked an airplane. A few days later, her father's two brothers, Dewey and Lynn Doyle, known as LD to his family, disappeared. And Marla Cooper never saw either of her uncles again. Could L.D. Cooper have been the mysterious hijacker known as D.B. Cooper? And if so, might he have audaciously used skills he learned as a U.S. Navy paratrooper during the Korean War? Skills that tied in directly to the unique make and model of the aircraft from which Cooper made his escape. From the documents I uncovered, what I learned was that that plane had been used by the CIA. And the CIA, the Vietnam War, had specifically used this Boeing 727 and the rear stairs, which came down on hydraulics, to drop parachutists and guns and food. Was Cooper somebody that potentially had connections with the CIA? I think that my uncle L.D. Cooper was used by the CIA for the hijacking. Used by the CIA? Why would the CIA want to hijack a domestic airline flight? In the nine years prior to D.B. Cooper's daring seizure of an aircraft, nearly 50 commercial flights had been hijacked in the United States, often by a politically motivated attacker demanding to go to Cuba. There was an epidemic of hijackings taking place during that time. President Nixon was desperate, and so was J. Edgar Hoover, who was in charge of the FBI to improve airport security. But like today, changes like that bring into question, are we losing our freedoms? You have to look at the results of the Cooper case. Very high publicized, very famous, not necessarily for getting away with the money, but for changing the climate of airport security in our nation. Now we go to an airport, we're scanned. The sterile terminal all came about because of Cooper. I didn't start out to be a conspiracy theorist, but I've really come to believe that there's classified information about the hijacking that has never been made public. Is it possible? that the U.S. government was behind the world's only unsolved hijacking? And if $5,800 of the ransom money washed up on the shores of the Columbia River, 
might the rest still be out there, waiting to be found? Perhaps it has vanished forever, along with D.B. Cooper, leaving nothing but unanswered questions and a colorful myth that persists to this day. A colorful myth. I like how uh, that, that's a little segment because it was this it was a little segment on a History Channel uh, broadcast. It's on uh, H2, I think, is the channel. It's funny. They, they, they broadcast like ice road truckers and all that reality TV garbage, and then anything that actually might have a semblance of truth to it goes on the other channel that you'd have to have the extra cable package to get. Uh, so you know, talk about hiding things. Of course, history, uh, you know, tweaks things or whatever, and they, they make it sound like an almost like an urban legend. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting twist. I'd never, I, I had, you know, I had heard about the the Marla Cooper chick back in the day, but with all the craziness going on, and you know, things that are going on around the world, you get sidetracked, right? Uh, but I, I had not realized the CIA connection, the idea that perhaps Cooper, the the whole hijacking, had been staged as um, almost like a false flag event. It was staged to bring about the sterile uh, airport that you now see when you go to the sterile security area in an airport where you go through. And uh, I mean, now you have TSA groping you and everything else. But the precursor to all of that was the fact that there wasn't really none of that until the hijacking of D.B. Cooper. And uh, like they mentioned uh, at the time, there was a bunch of other hijackings going on. Uh, and a lot of times the hijackings were being blamed on people that were Cubans and, oh, my God, we want to hijack the plane and take it to Cuba. And, uh, you know, you, if you look up, you, you can look up, uh, what the hell is the name of that? Uh, Operation Northwoods. Look up Operation Northwoods and see what they wanted to do to justify an invasion of Cuba. So it, if you understand... Even you know, putting nine eleven and all that aside, if you understand that at the time they were actually contemplating, you know, Operation Northwoods, you know, doing terrorist bombings and blaming it on Cuba, but it would be the you know agents of the the federal government and the military uh, pulling off you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, basically um, having military special ops and CIA whoever doing this these type of operations and then blaming the Cubans to justify an invasion of Cuba. Well. You know, if they if they were willing to do that fifty years ago, who's to say that they wouldn't have false flagged something into calling for tighter airport security because you just didn't have it. You had this freedom, you know, back then. And now, now, oh my God, you have to be scared. There's the boogeyman. He might get you. We need to. Oh my God, you know, airport security came about because of the hijackings, Popeye. Well, maybe we should go look at those hijackings again. And not just Cooper's hijack. I mean, the the, the 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 thing with Cooper. I mean, that's in and of itself is interesting. And I'm going to be digging into this further. As I said, I'm getting one of the authors uh, on that. Uh, uh, you heard him talking. His name of his book is called uh, Skyjack. If I can remember, let me see if I can find his name for you, so I can tell you what his name is. Um, let me see if I can find it. Jeffrey Gray, and the name of the book is Skyjack. Uh, it's G E O F F R E Y G R A Y Jeffrey Gray, and the book is called Skyjack. Uh, I'm working on getting him on to talk about his book and talk about the the case of uh, D. B. Cooper and go into this uh, even in more detail. But um, any uh, Cooper's the the Cooper case aside, look at all the other hijackings around that time period uh, in the the, the 70s. A, a, a late '60s, early '70s. Look at the all the any of the hijackings that went on. Look at any you know whether it was being blamed on Iran or whether it was being blamed on this group or that group or Cuba or whoever. You know, e even if it wasn't the Cubans that were being blamed, say it was, you know, say it was some Middle Eastern hijacker, and they say, "Oh my God, the you know, see the guy's Middle Eastern, so he must by default be evil, and all Middle Easterners are evil, and he must be Iranian, and this and that." What happens if those guys were actually not members of uh, these these countries, you know, not uh, citizens of these countries, not agents of these countries? What happens if they were agent provocateurs of our own government being used to stage these events to call for tighter airport security and a, a climate of fear. I mean, does that sound out of place? Because that's what you see going on right now, right? You have the underwear bomber, uh, Abdul Mutalib, 
Uh, you got all these other people that are uh, these other events like Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. So how do we know if we if we know the underwear bomber case is fake, which we do? I've interviewed Kurt Haskell. He was one of the witnesses, one of the people that was on the plane, right? To my archives, go back and, and listen to it. So if if we know the underwear bomber case is BS, and we know that you know they admitted that a State Department official had to get the dude on the plane, who's to say that the government back then wouldn't have done it? I don't want to hear that they weren't that sophisticated. Please, they killed Kennedy. They killed the freaking president. You don't think that they could pull something like D.B. Cooper's hijacking off? And, you know, the, the guys that do it, they get paid with whatever loot that they make from the heist, right? And the only thing they have to do is scare people and scare the general public enough and bring enough attention to a subject that the news media can then spin it any way that the powers that shouldn't be want it and get the emotions of the people all riled up into pushing for tighter restrictions and tighter laws because, hey, it's all in the name of safety. Hmm. Where have I seen this motif practiced before? This seems vaguely familiar to me. Hmm, where have I seen... Oh, it's going on right now. Flying planes into buildings, hijackers, oh my god, terrorism, Osama bin Laden, 9-11, woo! Except in, instead of creating a sterile security environment at the airport, or invading Cuba, because, hey, we almost did that. But instead of invading Cuba, we invaded Iraq. We invaded Afghanistan. Hmm. Playbook seems eerily similar. Hmm. Hmm. But I guess I shouldn't take any note of that. I should just think that's a coincidence and carry on smartly, right? No. No. You should look at that stuff. Obviously, there's something going on, and it's just – I said this the other night when I was talking to all the guys that we were on Hangar 18 with. Great crew, by the way. you gotta, you got to go listen to the, the shows, the, the archives uh, over on uh, Truth Frequency Radio. Uh, Chris and Cherie, uh, go, great job running the site. They, they do a hell of a job. You know, Chris is uh, up sometimes for a day and a half straight fixing you know, a little thing here, a little thing there, trying to make everything um, – user friendly as possible and uh not only for the the listeners but also for the host so a uh, big thank you to chris and sheree but they've got the hangar 18 section up in the archives you should go listen to it this past saturday was great we just had a huge round table we even brought a couple hosts over from another network uh, an older network that joe and i used to be on and uh these guys are friends of ours and they do hell of a good job doing radio they're just really good guys uh ken hildebrand and uh johnny english um They've been on my show multiple times before, just very good friends. They were on. It was just a really, really good discussion, but I brought up this whole uh, D.B. Cooper thing, and uh, Ken Webb put it best. He said, you know, uh, I, I can't look at anything now uh, without seeing so, – you know, it's amazing. Like you can't look at these old stories and these old things that we were told and, and not look at it and realize that there's more to it now. It's like as soon as you put on Hoffman's sunglasses, everything, and I mean everything, has to be – scrutinized over again we have to go through everything you can't just take it for granted and go well no 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 because often when you go back and you look you find a connection to this older stuff to something that's going on today you'll find a similarity you'll find some sort of connection and it it, it just goes to show you that this is a playbook this is an agenda obviously this isn't obama it's a, it's not obama wants to ruin the country or before him it was bush wants to ruin the country and then before him oh clinton and then before him it was bush senior and before him it was reagan and before him it was uh, jimmy carter and so on and so forth. Let's keep blaming the guy before because it's all the president's fault. It's never the people that actually pulled the strings and get the guy in power, right? I mean, Obama didn't pay for himself to get in office. Let's be honest. Did, did he Did he fundraise himself? No, he did not. He had people pay money for him to go out and ride around on his bus and lie and politic and all that stuff. So when people pay money out for you like that, um, they end up wanting you to pay it back eventually. Right? So how do you think you pay it back? They're all like that. All of them. 
can't just blame. Yeah, that's why I get mad when, when people go, "Oh, it's Obama's fault." No, when it's Bush's fault. No, 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 no. Stop. They're puppets. There's obviously a much larger agenda going on. They're just the front man for you to get pissed off at. While you know the people behind the scenes continue to do the things that they do. I mean, blaming presidents and getting pissed at politicians obviously hasn't solved the problem, right? Oh, it's all their fault. Well, yeah, that solves the problem. Name calling, yeah, that solves the problem. <laughs> Finger pointing, yeah, that really solves the problem. I mean, how about how about we move beyond that? Hmm? How about we move to actually solving some of these problems? Obviously, there's an agenda going on. It's not the politicians. It's there's more to it. And again, you put on your Hoffman sunglasses, ladies and gentlemen. You start to look at things with a different set of eyes. You start to go, whoa. This is crazy. What are you, nuts? I still do. I mean, there are times I come across things like the first time I came across this, the information about the Titanic years ago. One of the listeners sent it to me. It was a reader, Federal Jack, said, hey, Papa, you might find, you might, uh, find this interesting. And I looked into it further. And at first I was like, oh, come on. They sunk the Titanic, please, really? I mean, not everything's a freaking conspiracy. Blah, 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 blah. It turns out, well, they did. I mean, it, you have to go back and look at everything that you thought you knew with a fresh set of eyes. Once you have that veil lifted off your eyes and you now have the, the Hoffman sunglasses on, you can see it says consume and obey and all that. You look around. You have to look back on at this stuff. I mean, I, I, I stumbled across this, this piece about D.B. Cooper, and I was like, what? But see, that would make a little more sense, wouldn't it? Incrementalization. And it would also be a, uh, a big example, or just another example of how they do false flag type events in order to bring about a political agenda or a, a, a change, whether it's slight or massive, whatever, whatever that part of the agenda requires, if they need that. They they do false flag type events, you know, fake things, whatever you want to call them, staged events. I mean, this goes back to, uh, again, this goes back to the 70s. Oh, now, I mean, if you think that it's too far out of the, you know, the, the realm of possibilities that they could have done this, I mean, come on. You got to sit back and look at the things that, again, look at history. Just look up what they were going to do back when Kennedy was in. About bombing Cuba. Operation Northwoods. When you see stuff like this, it's like as soon as I saw this and I, I and I, I, I heard this and I started researching it, looking into it, that's what I thought. I was like, oh wow. I mean it it just uh, history is interesting when you have your, your uh, sunglasses on and you start to look back through things and you can weed through the BS. I'll I'll put it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. Man, I ranted tonight, didn't I? Oh, well, I needed to. Tomorrow night, tune in, five-hour special, going from Kenneth Webb's broadcast on up through mine. Joe, Kenneth, myself, Dr. Pujo, whoever else shows up. Until then, the solutions to our problems are most definitely an inside job, ladies and gentlemen. And never, ever, ever lose your interest in learning. I love you all. I'm out of here.